Hi hey everyone, my name is PK. Here in front of me, I have Sneer Shah, who's a client or a student of the Property Investment Accelerator, and I'm very grateful and and pleased to have him on today and and go through his property journey because he's very experienced. <laughs> he's done eight property transactions, three of which have just been in the last three to four months, and that's been through the course. But we're going to dive deep into his broader strategy, perhaps his lending strategy, why he's purchased the, the property he has, the properties he had, why he's sold some properties before as well. He's a IT professional based in Melbourne, and I think this will be really insightful. I'll just introduce the session by going through some of the key highlights from these three properties, just to whet everyone's appetite. So the first property he bought through the course was in regional Queensland. He bought this for three forty nine. This wasn't that far back, right? This was like in the last six months, and yep. its valuation was already by another bank post settlement at four ninety five, which was great. And the rent's four seventy, so that's almost a seven percent yield. So that that's fantastic. With the upside for another bedroom, we might go into that during the discussion as well. Second property bought over in WA three thirty, renting for five fifty. So that's an eight point. 0.7% yield is like how is that even possible I'll ask him as we go through the the session and so that made two properties in 3 months for him through the course and then the third property was bought once again in Queensland in a different location for 395700 and he negotiated more than $20,000 on that one renting for 500 a week from June this year once the rents go to market rents and yeah it's not like a super old property or anything but it was just poorly marketed but the tenants have been there for for 14 years so anyway those are some highlights just to whet everyone's appetite but I think my first um, question and and by the way congratulations um, Snae on and all that but my first sort of question is just like you know, you've put in a lot of work. Like, how do you feel about your your property portfolio as it stands at the moment? Yeah, so I think uh, if I have to answer in one word, I feel confident, VK. So uh, now having done so many property transactions, I would say in last few years, and I think I'm becoming more confident. And that's why now you see I'm, I'm increasing my pace, which is which is the result of why I have three, four, three properties bought in the last three to four months. So uh, yeah, I think... Uh, I feel good, more confident, and uh, looking forward to where the journey forms and shapes. Nice, nice. Well, that I think that's the most important thing. I mean, confidence, I feel, even if you have all the numbers, all the data, all the skills, unless you have that confidence, that, which actually comes, yeah. I'll ask you in a second this as well, actually just comes from doing. Confidence yeah. comes from action. Unless yeah. you have that, then you actually don't get any results. But let's let's kind of yeah. rewind all the way back. Um, I think you said before we hit record that you've been in Australia. What was it? Five years or around uh, around yeah, five years? Almost six years now. I think. Almost I think I six came, years. I mean, yeah, almost six years now. Right, right. And so, like, how how did you make your first baby steps into property, or or in other words, what's been your property experience before doing the course? Yeah, because so since since I I was born and raised in India and uh, I moved to Australia, it was completely unexpected for me. Uh, it was like you know two months before I came here in April twenty eighteen. So yeah, six years now, April twenty eighteen. In Jan twenty eighteen, I didn't know I was gonna come to Australia, so it was very unexpected for me. Uh, but before that, my life in India, I I had this goal that you know I had it written down in my uh, in my uni days that. I'm going to have my own house uh, by 2020 paid off. Uh, so I always had this attachment with property. I always had the dream of buying my own uh, and, you know, not, not having any debt on my house. Mm -hmm. uh, and back in India, when I was, uh, when I had my cousins in US, I had heard of the situations where, you know, they were, their repayments were less than the, uh, rent that they were getting, which was not possible and which was unheard of in India. So mm -hmm. I think when I got a chance to come to Australia, uh, it was always there at the back of my mind. I want to explore how, what the market, real estate market is in Australia and, and if it's a good option for me to start investing over here. So uh, yeah, when we came here, I think for, for, for first one year, I was renting 
Uh, and then when it was decided, when I got my PR, uh, it was finalized that, okay, we are going to stay here forever now. Uh, I immediately wanted to buy uh, a property to, to for us to live in. So that was my first property that I bought. And I think this was in 2020. Uh, yeah. And this was in Point Cook in Melbourne. So, yeah, I while I was, uh, you know, looking to buy this, uh, I was exploring how do I determine, you know, this is a good property for me. Uh, and internet research and all that, I came across buyer's agents. I came across a lot of data that we have on internet. Uh, now we have more a lot of noise but uh even at that time i think there was a lot of information available so uh but yeah i was lucky to kind of find my first uh property over there but during that search i did come across or stumble pro uh, across a few buyers agent that i interacted with uh and then i kind of did to my you know it may be a good idea to leverage a buyer's agent if i'm buying a property for investment but not for my owner occupied uh but that was my first interaction with uh investing in property uh talking to a buyer's agent and then being just exposed to uh you know uh property as an investment right right so you bought your first principal place of residence in australia in point cook and yes. then is it that you uh used a buyer's agent to buy some no. properties or what was the next steps no, so this was, uh, I bought it on my own without a buyer's agent. But while I was searching for this, I did come across a couple of buyer's, ag buyer's agents where I thought of leveraging them, but I didn't end up uh, taking their help in buying the property. Uh, so yeah, this was my first property. I bought it for around 650K uh, mm -hmm. at the point of time. And uh, one mistake which I did was I did not think forward. Uh, uh, we have a daughter who was who would be school eligible in next two years but we didn't think about school zone and all that stuff at that point of time so oh. <laughs> excuse me i bought a property without thinking about uh you know if i'm okay to send my daughter to the school zone in that area or not right so one year fast forward uh when we started thinking about okay we need to put our daughter to school and we determined that there was a uh here we have alameda school zone which is considered to be a good school zone uh, so I like, okay, you know, we need to put our daughter in this school. So we better buy a property in this school zone. So that's how I started looking for my next property. This would be my investment property for at least a year. The plan was that we would move into the move into that property after my daughter is uh, old enough to uh, go to the school. So yeah, that's how kind of I bought my second property in the school zone. The plan was for me to move in, uh, but because we bought it before one year, I uh, leased it out to a tenant. So this was my second property, again in Point Cook. Uh, I think typical, right? I mean, you you buy your first IP in your backyard typically. So that's kind of uh, the story here. Mm -hmm. uh, this And this was ripe during the COVID time. So I remember I had not even seen the property on my own. Uh, I had not inspected the property. Of course, I'd done the uh, building and pest. Uh, but I made a decision to buy the property. Uh, looking at the photos, uh, I know the I knew the location really very familiar with the location, but the property itself I had not inspected. And uh, yeah, I bought that property for around seven fifty, uh, and that was rented for four fifty per week. Uh, okay. Yeah, at the point of time. Right, right. So that was your second property, uh, which was a, a rental for a period of time, then you moved in. And then and then what happened? Like, you know, I think you've transacted eight properties. So you know, it seems like yeah. you've done a lot in the few years. What's what's happening next? So the second property that I just spoke about, that was a mistake, actually. And I think you could have you probably could have figured it out when I was talking about that. I don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> because at that point of time when I when I bought it. Uh, the interest rate was like 2.2% uh, for interest only. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think the yield was around 3.2%. Uh, I was okay with that uh, because I was able to afford it and was not, I, mean, I was short of around 200, 300 per month, which was okay mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and no one was talking about uh, interest rate hikes at that point of time. All the banks were like, you know, we don't foresee any interest rate increase for the next two to three years. Yeah. So I was like, okay, uh the you know the prices will go up eventually so I, I i don't mind 
uh, anyway, so yeah, I bought this. It was uh, negative geared uh, even at that point of time, but it was okay. Uh, now, when my daughter wanted to go to school, or she was uh, uh, you know old enough to go to school, we kind of then decided, okay, are we going to move into this property or not? Then we determined, okay, it's a little bit small for us, so we would not move into that property. So we bought my second PPUR, so essentially another property uh, where we would move into, again in the school zone, uh, and then we'll keep this one as investment and sell off the first property that I bought. Right. So that was the third property uh, that I bought. Uh, while this was happening, uh, I then leveraged or engaged a buyer's agent uh, who was or is very famous, I would say, uh, Ria Hall of Fame and all that. And then uh, uh, they helped me buy an investment property in Townsville. Uh, and this was in 2022. So I engaged them in uh, end of 2021. And then we settled on the property that they recommended in 2020, Jan 2022. Right. Uh, now, when I was comparing the two investment properties, I had that at that point of time. So one in Point Cook and the one that was in Townsville. Uh, the Townsville one was positively geared at that point of time. And then that was kind of uh, neutralizing the negative gearing of the Point Cook one. So I was mm. still okay with it yeah. at that point of time. Uh, and then I... I was continuously reading and learning from the groups in on Facebook uh, and YouTube videos. People like you, you know, who who are uh, gracious enough to kind of you know deliver content, good content uh, for us to learn. Uh, so yeah, I, I I kind of realized and made up my mind that it is it is better to invest in in regional rather than in capital cities. Uh, you have to consider yields. You have to consider cash flow. Uh, it is not that you get capital growth only on low yield properties. It's not that you get capital growth only in capital cities. At that point of time, when I joined, you know, there was this debate: Are you investing for cash flow or are you investing for capital growth? I was like, it's not either or. You can get both, hmm. right? But there, there, there was this conception that, and a lot of people bought into it. Uh, but yeah, so that was uh, at that point of time, after buying this first IP. Through the buyer's agent, I was I was more convinced that you know, next investment properties that I buy, uh, I have to consider cash flow, and I would probably be betting on regional as opposed to buying in capital cities at that point of time. Um, so we bought my third, sorry, the fourth property now, which is which became my second PPOR after two IPs, uh, and then I hit a situation where I was completely out of my borrowing capacity. Right. And I realized the uh, extreme situation of that when I was when I applied for a credit card and I was rejected, uh, it was rejected by the bank. So that came as a shock because never in my life I had been in a situation where <laughs> a bank would reject my credit card application. It would be the other way around where, you know, everyone would go. Normally they're Biden forcing you to yeah. take one because they want right. to make money off you. So and, and the interest rates had started going up. So that's when I realized the criticality of the situation I'm in that, you know, OK, I'm OK to. I'm able to digest the negative gearing of the property that I have in, in Point Cook, but that does not look good on my financial status right now. Banks are you know, not giving me critical, which means it's a critical situation. So uh, I have to kind of, so when the, and as I said, when I when I bought it, the interest rate was 2.2. Uh, 10, 12 months down the line, the interest rate was six, more than 6%. So my initial repayments, which were around twenty two hundred per month, now they are forty six hundred per month, and my rent continued to be around, uh, you know, two thousand per month. Right. So what I was two hundred dollars negative per month, I started becoming twenty six hundred dollars per month negative, right? Which kind of went on. Which adds up. Uh, yeah. So I had to make up my mind whether should I continue absorbing and keeping this property or should I sell it off? Uh, luckily, we decided to sell it off and we were, and again, lucky enough that the property did grow in value. I bought it for 750 and I was able to sell it for 815. So considering all the loss I had through, uh, uh, through the interest, it did grow uh, to, to make it net neutral, essentially. Right. So it didn't make profit or loss on that one. 
but I was lucky I decided to sell that off because if I had kept it for another six months, uh, you know, I would have actually made a loss, pretty terrible loss on that. Uh, so that was all my learning phase of making mistakes. And, and then, you know, uh, actually, I did make one more mistake on that because I refinanced that property and I over-indexed on borrowing. <clears> and <throat> so I bought that property for seven fifty, dollars uh, as I told you. Yeah. And then CBA valued that property for 900 Okay. So I was very happy. I was like, you know, yay. So, and then I went ahead and borrowed 90%. On that property, paying LMI to CBA uh, with the valuation of nine hundred. Mm -hmm. So, and then I was not able to refinance it back because none of the other banks were valuing the property at that valuation. Right. And so I had a I had a loan or, or I had a debt of around eight twenty on that property, mm -hmm. and the valuation of the property itself was around eight fifteen or eight hundred. Right. So it was a very very bad situation. Uh, so. The important lesson I learned from that is I now don't really go by bank valuation uh, mm -hmm. and I don't over index on borrowing on my existing properties without being sure that I can actually sell the property at that value in the market at a in current market. Right, right. So would it be so, fair to say, um, Snare, that when you started your your journey, I mean, you mentioned that you didn't really consider school zones when you bought that first property. And that's why you bought that second property that was intended to be lived in, but then you never really intended, you never ended up living there because it was a bit small and 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 not ideal. Um, and then all, you know, this property is also was highly negatively geared. So I'm just trying to, to gauge because I think this might be useful for everyone. You know, you made a lot of transactions, but I mean, you're a very intelligent guy, right? You're an IT professional. You're, you're clearly, um, you know, very, very intelligent. I, I'm not saying these were not intelligent decisions, but I'm just trying to enter into your mindset. Was it like rushed or was it like the community around you feeding misinformation accidentally, like well-meaning misinformation or was it other influences? I'm just trying to understand like how you made these, if you would call them mistakes. Yeah. So I think the the decision of buying in the school zone was was a bit of both, right? Because when you're part of, when you're living in an area, you, you interact with friends and neighbors, right? You hear things that, you know, this is a really good school zone. Mm -hmm. And then because at that stage in my life, I was, school zone was really important to me personally. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, you know, uh, an impacting factor in making an investment decision, which should not be the case. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah. And, and then it was there, there was an assumption which was not backed by data that, you know, uh, this area, properties in this area will always be in demand because of the school zone. So it will always keep on increasing. Again, not backed by any data, just by uh, general understanding, I would say, just by general assumption. Right. So, that led me to believe that it's a safe bet to kind of buy a property in a good school zone, uh, even if it is negatively indexed. And then again, relying on the government reports that, you know, interest rates are not going to go high, you know, uh, it will be okay. So I did calculate that, okay, am I going to be able to sustain this property long term? But it was based on, uh, it was not backed by data, it was essentially based on misinformation, which was circulating at that point of time. Right. Well, I think you can be forgiven for that because myself included, yeah. I don't think anyone expected rates yeah. to go up this fast. Um, but no, that's that's a good insight. And so you bought that that first interstate investment property uh, through the buyer's agent. And then, okay, now you have, you know, something that's more positively geared, at least at the time, you're selling some yeah. of your previous assets what's your mindset now? Like, what's your strategy at this point in time? Are we thinking 2022 yeah. at this point, right? Yes. Yeah. So now I have seen, I've seen the, that, you know, investing in regional uh, properties is better for me. I've, I've kind of understood that. But uh, my experience of buying through a buyer's agent, I wouldn't say it was that positive, right? So financially, it has been okay. But uh, there was always this, fear that you know i don't know what is being proposed to me is correct or not for me mm -hmm. right 
Uh, so this specific buyer's agent kind of works in a way that, you know, you, you, they you you they don't take any input from your side. They say, you know, we will give you a property. You say yes or no to us. If you say no, you have to explain why. Uh, and if not, you essentially just take this, right? So we we are like doctors. We prescribe you a medicine, and then you take this medicine. Essentially, that that was their approach. Right. I was like, okay, that's fine because I don't have that information. I don't have the knowledge to buy uh, the investment properties. But how do I validate that? Because there's no guarantee or warranty that the buyer's agent would give you right what if this property does not grow what if it turns out to be a dead investment are you going to repay me back the fees that i paid you there's no uh what do you call it uh ownership on their side in terms of you know what what uh you know how would they pay me back if it goes down it's my loss if it goes good uh you know the anyway is making the money out of it so i wanted to uh, learn this. I wanted to understand how do I, well, even if I use a buyer's agent, you know, if I, uh, for my next properties, if I'm not able to invest time to identify and buy, I still need to understand how do I validate whatever they are proposing to me? Is this a good buy for me or not? Considering right. my financial situation, all that. So uh, I was, uh, yeah. So the property they recommended was in Townsville in 2022. So as you know, it has been good in Townsville so far. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't know at that point of time whether this is a, and I didn't like that situation where I was uncertain and I was kind of just completely dependent on someone else's decision uh, of, you know, of my investment, on my investment. Right. So right. that's where I kind of came across your course and decided to uh, educate myself to be able to buy investment properties on my own. Right, right. So it was a case of like, okay, I trust this buyer's agent enough because they've won awards, et cetera, um, to be able to part with, you know, their fee, but I don't like necessarily trust them enough to do the right thing. So it's either like they won't do the right thing or they're incompetent, right? Because that's where a lack of, that's where the necessity of validation or verification comes from. You've trusted them em enough to to pay them their fee, whatever the fee was, but it's like, okay, but are they competent? Okay, I'm not sure. Or if they are competent, are they doing the right thing by me? Like, is there a character? Do they actually care about me? So which, you know, the need to verify this whole concept that you're talking about, was it a mixture of, oh, I'm not actually sure if they're any good at what they do, or is it more like, okay, I'm pretty sure they're good at what they do, but are the deals that they're sending me, do they really care about me? Do they understand me? Like, do you understand my question? Was it yeah. one of these two or was it something else entirely? No, so it was not me doubting their their professionalism or, you know, their intent towards me, anything like that. Uh, see, in terms of uh, deciding to go ahead with the buyer's agent, I didn't see any other option, right? I At that point of time, I was not sure what is the other option for me because I knew that if I had to buy it estate, I don't know. I don't know how to validate and verify, you know, what data points to look at, uh, how to go about it. I, I was completely blank, right? So so at that point of time, the only option uh, for me was to go with a buyer's agent. Now, uh, the reason I decided on a specific buyer's agent was because I could align with the approach that they suggested in their promotional videos. You know, this is how we do, this is how we uh, uh, identify suburbs and all that stuff. So they were the only uh, ones who kind of, I was agree in agreement with, with their approach, right. what they told that. So, so, but I didn't know if they were, if that the approach that they were suggesting, was that just promotional or did they actually implement those while searching a property for me, right? So they tell you that, okay, we do this, 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 X, Y, Z, but I didn't know if they were actually doing that. Or was that just promotional for getting clients, right? Mm -hmm. So, and there was no no way for me to validate. And I didn't kind of uh, doubt their intention or whether they were lazy or something like that. But I always have this need to be 100% aware of all the decisions that I'm making that are being made for me, right? Why are we buying here? What is the logic? What are the data points? Why do you think this is good for me, right? And and and, and if someone else is, so if, if I'm paying a professional, then that professional needs to be held accountable for it, right? which is not the case for buyers agents right now. Uh, th there's no regulation around it. So if I'm paying $15,000 to someone 
And if that investment goes dud, the buyer's agent cannot be held accountable for that in any way and form. Right. So that's mm-hmm. why I think it was more important for me to self-educate and learn. And and because I knew that I wanted to build a, a portfolio of property, it didn't make sense for me to kind of go through the same feelings every time I buy a property. And I can pay 15000 every time I buy a property and having to come trust someone else to, you know, uh, make that decision for me. Right. OK, I understand. It's a it's a good uh, gateway into to your mindset, because I asked that because I think a lot of people might be going through that. You know, like at the start, you said, I asked you how you feel about your portfolio and you said confident. And I think yeah. um, I'm putting words in your mouth here right now, but I think because you've actually learned everything yourself is, yeah. and now you can verify or validate what's a good deal if your portfolio is good or not, is that yeah. what is building yeah. you or giving you that confidence now? Absolutely. So, uh, and and the initial stories, the in, initial transactions that I said, right, they were mistakes that I made. And then I've learned from that, those transactions, I've learned from those experiences, I know what not to do. Uh, my experience of selling two properties also kind of gives me a very good exposure to what goes into the sales agent's mind when you're selling a property, right? What's the relationship between the vendor and the sales agent? Right. When is a sales agent under a pressure and they can actually put pressure on the vendor to sell if the property has not been selling for quite some time, for example. Right. So so these have been the learnings which and then I try to apply those in my last two, three uh, property purchases and they have resulted uh, in a good way so far. So uh, that gives more confidence to me kind of to continue applying what I've learned and being more confident in buying. More right. Properties. And um I'm not, I'm not trying to plug my course, but I'm just trying to ask this question from a confidence perspective. Was all the data factors, all the processes and procedures and, you know, the contacts that I provide in the course, et cetera, did that satiate your your appetite for like really sinking your teeth into investing and understanding everything from all angles to to be able to then, I mean, it's kind of a self-fulfilling question because I know you've bought three properties, but I'm just trying to understand yeah. like, because, you know, you're an IT professional. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. I'll edit out later if I can't. You work for Amazon. So it's like, you know, it's a very analytical mind that that you would have, I would say. Um, yeah. So so do you think that, like, I, is there still elements that you're not confident about or was the the data that is taught, like, you know, did it just plug that gap for you? So I think what how your course really helped me was the structural approach and how how to kind of go about uh, you know identifying the suburbs I think step by step process of it eliminating suburbs and st- stuff like that right so that was the I think the main learning for me uh, the second really good learning for me was also how to interact with different professionals that so. Uh, how to engage, what questions to ask to the sales and to understand a better picture, mm-hmm. right? And that combined with my learnings of working with my sales agent, kind of, it kind of added to that, right? So, uh, yeah, I think I think uh, from my experience and what was taught in the course kind of gave me a complete, I would say, if not hundred percent, at least ninety nine percent of what I need to know uh, to make. Uh, yeah, next property purchase. Uh, it gives me a very good understanding of what to do, what not to do, how to approach, how to identify, and things like that. And I don't know if you uh, noticed the trend in the last three properties that I have. Uh, it started actually with the second PPO that I bought, right? So I always try to, I I think I'm observing this pattern that I kind of find uh, poorly marketed properties mm-hmm. and then I pitch really low uh, and then I kind of, somehow become successful in getting that. So the second PPO that I bought, which was my fourth property, that was actually marketed as 1.1 million. Okay. And I bought that for 930. Right. So, uh, and that was on the market for like two and a half months. So I knew that the sales agent was under pressure for selling that. Uh, and he was not able to sell that in a hot market. Uh, and I was like, you know, let me put 930. If it, if they take it, great. If not, uh, I'm not losing anything kind of thing. Right. It took it. So uh, so that gave me some experience and confidence. Uh, I did the same thing for the first uh, IP that I purchased through uh, through after your course, uh, which is, you know, uh, which is I bought for 350 uh, and then now it is valued at 500. So it was a property which was not marketed well, 
and i think the one of the key factors you know when when you to find and identify a property that not when your pictures are not very good right when the pictures photos are not professional they are blurred mm. phone images kind of thing you know that the the sales agent has not really done a lot of uh, you know put a lot of effort into marketing this well the second point that i generally say is if you have make, made an re inquiry uh, you know through through realestate.com if they don't get back to you uh, if you try to send them a message or a call they don't return it that means you know they either not doing their job properly of course it's a different situation in a hot market but in a cooler market if that happens and if the property has been listed for you know more than a month yeah uh, then there's a good chance that the property may be good but the sales agent is not doing the job properly kind of thing right right let, let me ask you a question. Um, this property that you're referring to, it was bought in Townsville. Um, yeah. You already had one through that buyer's agent in Townsville. Um, why, like, what gave you confidence to buy two in Townsville? Because up until this time, <clears throat> it's not yeah. like you had a diversified portfolio already. You know, yeah. you only had those Melbourne assets. So, yeah. like, why double down and and not instead of diversifying? So that was that was the biggest question I had at that point of time. Uh, one of the one of the thought process was, you know, I've paid fifteen thousand to a good buyer's agent to help me identify an area to buy a property. Now I know the area, right, which is expected to be good. So why don't I just buy buy a second property? This was even before doing your course, right? So this was like, why shouldn't I buy? It? There was a property just next door, right? So my immediate the property that I have right. uh, just next door to that there was property that went up for sale like you know why don't I buy this <laughs> no one no diversification <laughs> <at all. laughs> so so that was I, I did debate that quite a bit but then essentially yeah I wanted to see you know it's good to diversify as well because what if this market doesn't boom right mm. so so then then I'm I ended up with you know two dot properties which are not growing <laughs> as opposed to one uh, so but then after going through your course uh all the data pointed again back to Townsville. So so that gave me more confidence that, okay, now I know. So one buyer's agent has approved it because based on their claim, this is a good area to buy in. I've done my own due diligence. I know the data points towards Townsville. It is going to go. So that gave me more confidence uh, in buying my next. So I didn't buy in the same suburb. Of course, it's still Townville, Townsville, mm -hmm. but uh, bought in a different suburb. Uh, and I, I felt two properties two properties is not too much in in one city mm -hmm. so yeah for the third property i would think more harder right uh, kind of thing but i was okay with my second property <clears throat> and you bought it for 349 this was late last year and it's valued by another bank you know just after settlement at 495 so that's a yeah. huge increase but you mentioned before that you you know now you take these bank valuations with a grain of salt because you've been yeah. burnt before this 495 yeah. is this a legit valuation you know in the course i teach you how to i think this is a really important point don't yeah. trust the bank valuation don't trust these automated online valuations from different websites you have yeah. to do that work yourself is this legit or did you when you valued it yourself do you think it's actually less so I, I think it was not legit at the time. So I bought this property in November, uh, 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it would have sold for 500 uh, at that point, uh, 495 at that point of time or the immediate next day. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would have it still valued at around 450. Uh, and the reason I know that is because the property next door uh, has was an inferior property and that sold for 425. Mm -hmm. So, and... Actually, that sale of property led me to buying this property. So when I was talking, the two properties side to you know next to each other, they were on sale, mm -hmm. uh, and I was more inclined to buy the property that was listed for four twenty five. Uh, and I was talking to the sales and because this one was not marketed well, I didn't like the look of it uh, from from the photos, right? So I was talking to the other sales agent, and he kind of hinted towards it. You know, the property next door is not marketed well. Uh, you know, they they they. They're not doing any open houses. Uh, it is a similar property, uh, but I am able to sell my property uh, for this much kind of. So that led me thinking: okay, if it's just not marketed well, then I think I, it's better for me to buy that one as opposed to what this guy is selling. So, uh, and then I, you know, uh, dived into that. Even if the sales agent was not responding to me a couple of times, I, I stuck on it. I went on, you know, sending him queries and texts and emails and tried calling him a couple of times. Eventually, he, he responded back, uh, and then I was able to buy the property. Right. Well, there's the lesson for, for everyone. 
you know, try to look for properties that look terrible from the pictures, from the ad, from the listing. Yeah. And if the, was it like an out of town agent or like, what was up with that? Like, were they just, yeah, I never heard or? of them before. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 they, they were, they were, I mean, I've not seen any other listings from this agent before. Uh, and I'm quite active in that market, looking at properties, uh, even just to keep up to the, to the, to the market. So I've not seen a lot of listings from them. So, yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's a and and one sort of tip I can also share for for everyone just trying to add as much value as I can is you know if you go to rate my agent you can also you can find the top agents but sometimes try to find like the in a Pareto like the the alienated like incognito yeah. agents that don't have much activity in a suburb because they're the ones who may actually I don't want to say this out loud but I will anyway they may not care about their client or vendor as much as other agents who value that suburb that yeah. really are active in that suburb and and you know just maybe a little bit more ethical so I mean as as property investors we we want to be ethical but if if there's a property to be to, that is selling for under market, then then yep. why not? So I think um, that's a really good. And there's also potential to add a fifth bedroom in this one. Uh, so now yep. how how would that look like? Like where would the fifth bedroom go? Have you? I mean, I teach this in the course, but how how much uplift could you get from that? So the the suburb that this is in, right? The five bedrooms are not that common, right? It's it's a the the general. Uh, three to four bedrooms is essentially more common. Uh, the good thing is it's a typical, you know, in, in the Queensland, you have ground level and, 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 you know, first level. But typically what you have is you have three bedrooms on top and then one bedroom is kind of uh, at, the, at the lower ground level. Uh, this one has four bedrooms on the top level. And then uh, at the uh, ground level, they have full living zone. Right, with a kitchenette and all that stuff. So it can kind of be completely uh, uh, self-sufficient uh, kind of a granny flat thing, uh, but they have not made it that way. <clears throat> so that's the potential of it. If we just add a wall over there, just one wall, uh, we can make that a complete detached, uh, <clears throat> not detached, but complete uh, bedroom, big bedroom uh, with a living room and with a kitchen uh, and a bathroom. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the potential that can be done over there and have you explored whether that's a legal height downstairs so it can actually be advertised as a fifth bedroom or i've not i've not done check the height yet the mm. so i i checked with the property manager if if we can kind of if we go through having separate meters and stuff like that can we have to you know do a local occupancy kind of thing right but they recommended not to go through that right now mm -hmm. uh so i may you know dive deeper into the legalities of things and what is the cost required to inject if you have to go that path mm -hmm. uh, later in the state but right now i'm not dived into that right right i mean it's a good problem to have and good opportunity to have um for sure i mean it's already a, a really high yield um, but if you can you know rent that out separately or even if you can't then you know you're attracting a, a family with with more occupants and they'll likely yep. uh, give higher rent so that's some value add potential i just want to skip to your second property in wa i mentioned it at the start of the episode it's got an 8.7 percent yield and it was purchased for 330 it's just south of um the perth region 8.7 percent yield sounds like there's got to be something wrong with this shortly, right? Like what, what's the cash, you know, like, okay, that's positive cash flow, even with current interest rates. Um, you know, I got to ask, like, how did you do that? It, it was not intentional. And I, I think I got lucky with this one as well. Uh, the property was marketed for 320. Uh, and then I was the first person to call the sales agent. It, it was, it is still a hot market over there. So, uh, yeah, the moment the listing came up, I called the sales agent and uh, asked him for the details. And then I put in an offer immediately. <clears throat> so the sales agent came back with, so I asked him, do we have a rental assessment for this one? Uh, he didn't have one. So I leveraged, you know, I had already engaged the property manager over there to help me with, uh, you know, inspecting the property on my behalf and kind of uh, doing the due diligence. Uh, so I asked uh, a rental assessment from the property manager and that came back uh, around 400 per week. Okay. So it was not this high yield. So when I when I decided to buy it, I was not aware that it's going to be this high yield. Uh, so, but we, we finalized the transaction. So they came back with a you know, counter offer of 330. I accepted it. And then we went ahead with the transaction. Uh, after 
before settlement, I think when we were doing the, uh, you know, building in PEST and all that stuff. Uh, so that's when I formally signed the property management contract with the agency, right? And then uh, I asked them for another proper uh, uh, assessment with a document. So initially they had just done a high level assessment and just sent me a number kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this time they allocated me with a property manager and then she told me, Sne, we can actually get 500, you know, do you want to try with that? I was like, yeah, why not? And I actually checked when when I, uh, you know, searched in real estate for rentals in the market, there was just hardly one or two rental properties available. Uh, so even, so, so similar condition, not not just similar condition, any kind, there were only one or two properties available for, for rent mm -hmm. and they were higher than 500, 550, 570 per week. So I was like, you know, even if this is inferior property to these that are listed, uh, there's no harm in trying to market it at 500 and see how it goes mm -hmm. so we put it at that and then yeah they, they took it right right it's like it's not as if there was a lot of comparables you know yeah. volumes of comparables it was just it was nothing f for yeah. rent and so therefore yeah. your property manager recommended have a shot i want to understand this from a tenant perspective like obviously we don't just take any tenant, you know, if, if they're giving yeah. an application for 550, um, did they, do they have the affordability? Like, you know, when you yeah. submit a application as a, as a tent, as a rental, you know, yeah. they, you have to show your income and all this sort of thing. Can they actually yeah. afford it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, we had five applications. So when we did the open house for, for, uh, rent, there were 14 people who, who kind of, uh, uh, visited the property to take a look at it in person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. We had five applications, uh, and then we validated each. We went through each one of those, and then we we identified the best one out of that. So this tenant did not have any pets, no kids, two ladies living there. Uh, uh, yeah, and they had. Uh, it was less than thirty percent of their uh, overall income and all that. Yeah, so Amazing. they checked all the boxes. Yeah, this is a really important point because I think sometimes in the in the mainstream media or, or other places as well. People think that rent rises, and this is a significant rent, right? Yeah, it was unexpected, yeah. as you said. That must mean that we're squeezing the tenant for every last, you know, dollar that they have, and being greedy yeah. and all that sort of thing. But this is, you know, less than thirty percent of their total income, so it's very, very affordable. So for me, yeah. it's it's a win-win. And this kind of opportunity isn't everywhere in Australia, but around that Perth area, incomes are very high. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think why not, as long as they're happy, I assume they're happy, they've got a, a, a rental, which is, you know, hard to come by these days. And, and you've got this fantastic 8.7. And the thing is like, eight, I mean, you know, this better than me now, 8.7% rents are only going to go up. I'm not saying they're going to yep. become 700 in 12, 12 months time yep. or anything like that, but they're going to go up rates may or may not come down this year, but they'll definitely come down at some point. So yep. this is sooner rather than later, it's going to become 10% yield, 11% yield. And, and, you know, just, just some assets like this over a 10 year horizon. And it's, it's just, I mean, I'm very happy for you. It's a no brainer. Yep. This is going to serve you really well. And thanks. Vic. And, and I want to add this point again, coming back to the uh, original point that I mentioned, right? So still there are people who discuss about, you know, you're not going to get capital growth in, in regional towns or in regional cities. So mm -hmm. while this is high yield, I bought it for 330. I settled on this in Jan, this 2024, right? So just before three, four months. Uh, today in the morning, there's a property listed in the same area, two bedroom, minus three bedroom. This is a two bedroom property, uh, older than this one, older than mine. So in every aspect, land size, uh, number of bedrooms, in every aspect, it's inferior property, and that has come to market for four sixty. So uh, it is not that if you have high yields, you are not going to get capital growth. You're def I'm, I'm, I definitely see capital growth coming on this one as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not got it valued. I'll wait for three four months to kind of get it revalued. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's lots of these myths, uh, Sne, and and I just want to ask you this question as well. We'll, we'll wrap it up soon. <clears throat> I don't mean to generalize, but, you know, there's a, a, a big migrant community in sort of Western Melbourne. There's a big migrant community in Northwest Sydney, other places around Australia as well. And, and I mean, I'm not necessarily plugged into these communities per se, but, you know, there's lots of WhatsApp groups. Everyone has friends, colleagues, yeah. you know, family members, extended family <laughs> members, and they all, everyone likes to talk about property. <laughs> we all yeah. have property as the next person, right? Yeah. And so there's all these like, 
misnomers that are thrown around. I want to ask you this question because I think you're in this position where you've made some mistakes. Um, you've kind of rectified them. Now you've, if I can say so, you're investing, you know, like a professional. What's your advice to someone who's, let's say, a few years into Australia, they're living in one of these communities, there are all these WhatsApp groups. You said yourself in 2020, there was a lot of information. 2024, there's so much information. You know, every single person's a buyer's agent. There's probably lots of courses, people like how should people go about it? Because it's I mean, it's it's so hard to know what's true. Everyone's saying a different thing. From your vantage point, what's what's your advice to someone like that? I think because it's very important to to have the ability to identify signal from the noise, right? So there's a lot of noise. Uh and you have to be exposed to the noise to, to understand, right? So you have to kind of expose yourself to every possible signal, every possible, you know, stream of information. That's whether it's through WhatsApp groups, whether it's through Facebook groups, whether it's through seminars, webinars, whatever it is, right? So that helps. But then I think you have to apply your intelligence, your logic to kind of filter down what is the actual content that is true that is validated, that is backed by data, and that's going to help you, and that is applicable to you as opposed to noise, right? So I think it is very important to to have that capability, and that comes only through, and you you have to take action, you have to learn, uh, and you may make some mistakes, uh, but I think as a lot of people say, you know, property in Australia is forgiving to, to a certain extent, right? So, so I think take action, uh, identify people uh, who are providing information backed by data uh, who you can rely on but still question them mm. uh, and and it's important question it's important to get the answers to those questions and it's important to be satisfied by those questions so only once you ask questions only once you validate that only once you're convinced you take that step and then uh, but it's important to take that step as well, because if you don't take, then it's just, you know, you'll be stuck in analysis paralysis kind of situation. I have a lot of friends who know about my investment story and then keep on asking me, you know, but why should I spend $700 in doing a building and pest? How can you buy a property without even looking at it? You know, all, all these sorts of things. So uh, I think you have to do it. You have to take action. But in order to be able to take that action, you have to be satisfied that you have thoroughly analyzed the content that is being presented to you and you have analyzed it, you have understood it, you have filtered it, you digested it, and then you make a decision based on that. Yeah, such a great answer. And I think that may come easier to someone like you or I who kind of have a analytical mindset. And even if you don't have an analytical mindset, I think people need to come out of their comfort zones because I think there's three types of people. One type of person who sees all this content. I mean, I was, I posted in the Facebook group the other day, I did this experiment. I was just scrolling on Facebook and I'm not even making this up. Every third ad was an ad from a buyer's <laughs> agent. I, I scrolled for 60 posts. Okay. So yeah. that was like yeah. 20 ads. So you think of like a, a newbie, it's like, you know, there's a lot. Yeah. So one person is like, I don't trust any of this. This is all made up, you know, get retire, retire early, rich, get, you know, all this sort of thing, forget it. And then they just go around with their nine to five. The second type of person says, oh, this is really hard. So let me just take a reference from someone or let me just pick one that I like the look of them. I vibe with their frequency. They seem like they they know what they're doing. They have a lot of Google reviews or whatever without yeah. really investigating or doing the due diligence or understanding their methodology. And you know, yeah. there was a lady, unfortunately, posted in the Facebook group. She went with one of these ads and bought two apartments off the plan in Melbourne. And it's like, yeah. terrible idea, $1 million down the drain. Yeah. That's the second type of person. All too hard. Let's just pick one. Hopefully it, it matures. The yeah. third type of person, this requires work. They're, they want to take action. So they're not like number one they do need help. So they, they are like the number two person, but they take the time. And honestly, there's no, there's no beating around the bush. It takes time yeah. to side by side, analyze all your options, whether it's courses, buyers, agents, you know, all different varieties of strategies. And then, like you said, I really want to hammer home this point, Snay, that you mentioned, ask the question so that the person that that business has to validate their methodology 
okay, does yeah. proximity to the CBD really matter in terms of growth? Do we need to be close to a train station? Is there a trade-off between, like you said, yield and capital growth? All these things, these are just three, there's hundreds of them. And then when you yeah. are satisfied with someone who gives you answers based on data, then maybe, just maybe, yeah. they're the ones that you need to seek assistance from. But that requires sacrifice. Everyone's busy. Everyone's got kids. Every, you know, but you have to yep. make that that effort. And I think property is something. I think too many people treat it whimsically, but it's a half a million dollar decision. You know, most yep. times. So I think that was a really good point that that you made. And um, maybe the last question, unless unless you had other things to to add on as well, is now you've got these four investment properties, four or five. Um, four. four investment properties, principal place what's your plan going forward? Like over the next five years, obviously not everyone has unlimited borrowing capacity. Yeah. What's your uh, strategy going forward? So lucky for me, because I still do have some some borrowing capacity uh, for my next purchase. Uh, so I'm just waiting for the deposit amount to accumulate. Uh, I, I personally, because I've been burnt on my second, you know, the first IP that I bought in, in, in Point Cook, I don't want to over-index on, on borrowing. So uh, I I don't want to leverage, because I have borrowing capacity, I don't want to kind of go and use the equity from my uh, existing IPs. I'm happy with you know, lowering the LVRs on that right now, uh, but I'm waiting to build some, some cash up and then I'll buy my next IP. I do want to get into, see again, right now I'm, I'm in the information gathering phase for commercial property. Mm -hmm. And I, I may have sent you a couple of emails on it. Are you preparing a course for commercial or not but i've received 10 requests this week yeah. i don't have a commercial course but 10 people have asked <laughs> yeah so so right now i'm kind of trying to analyze because I, i'm hearing a lot of people saying that you know you should invest in commercial it's better than residential i've i've still not found convincing answers on why is commercial better than residential mm -hmm. uh at the given current interest rates so I'm still trying in, in the process of kind of analyzing that and digesting that, uh, still, still asking questions. Uh, not a lot of people are able to provide answers, to be honest on that. If, mm -hmm. if you can suggest some resources, that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. But that's something which I'm exploring. Uh, till then, I'll continue buying residential properties. Right. Well, I think that. you've inspired me, actually. What I might do um, is on one of the Tuesday client mentoring calls, I might dedicate that hour uh, to just going through the pros and cons of commercial, even though I don't cover commercial necessarily yeah. in my course, but I think there's probably hundreds of people like you yeah. in the course that are just got it in their mind. So would that be a good idea? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's do that in the coming weeks. But let's let's wrap it up there, um, Snewa. I I really appreciate your time. Um, you know, I'm really grateful that you put your trust in me. I'm sure, I mean, I don't know the, the thought process, but I'm sure it didn't come overnight. It, I'm sure you did a lot of analysis and, and due diligence on me. Can I ask a cheeky question? And I might, might yeah. shoot myself in the foot here, but I'll, I'll edit it out if it's not the right answer. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, had you known about me before going with that buyer's agent, would you still have gone with the buyer's agent or would you have done the course? It would have depended on what, what videos I would have seen from you because see what convinced me to go with that buyer's agent was their promotional videos in terms of their approach and methodology and you know and that was convincing for me to say okay if they are doing this then logically that seems like that'll you know uh, reach the light right location kind of thing so if i had come across some videos where you would have highlighted your approach or what you, you know you're getting in the training content uh then yeah, I, I, if I was convinced to uh, uh, that I would be getting the right content what I'm looking for, then yes, I would have done your course before. Nice, nice. Maybe I need to do some promotional content. I don't really do that stuff, <laughs> but uh, good, good to know. Well, great to catch up with you, Sne, and um, thank you for being so generous. And I think the way that you've articulated your thoughts have been very raw and honest. And I think that that kind of really does land with with people and probably thousands are going to watch and listen to this. So you've just immensely helped them. So um, on behalf of them too, thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure, PK. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for watching or listening. As you know, there's, I always say this, but there's more than 130 of these types of interviews with property investment accelerator clients in the client results playlist on YouTube. I always say this as well. I honestly don't mind if you do the course or don't do the course, but at least take the time to go through these videos because just like with Sne, you'll get 
you'll just get the type of content that you don't get anywhere else, like truth and, and just honesty and, and real world experience. And that will hopefully inspire you and educate you to take action, whatever that action is for you. Hit the subscribe button, give it a like. Thank you for watching. And once again, thank you, Snape.